Hello and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Barbara Borgia and I create content on studying abroad. In today's episode, I have with me Joseph Amponsa. To be honest, um, Joseph's story is quite unique and is different from the people have, I have interviewed. So he's actually the first person I know who actually did an HND, did a top up, and he's currently in the US for his studies. Also, he's the first person I know who went to a technical school. Actually, I didn't know it was a big deal going to a technical school, but apparently there, there are certain differences when you're applying to study abroad. So if you have friends who did an HND, send this video to them. If you have friends who went to a technical school and they want to study abroad, send this video to them. So without wasting much time, Joseph, can you tell us about yourself? Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um... In fact, I'm very happy to share my experience with other colleagues who are trying to apply um, to study abroad. Seriously, I'm very happy. So um, my name is Joseph, as you've already mentioned. I'm a first year double PhD student in the U.S., specifically at State University. And I'm from Ghana, to be specific. I graduated from Cape Coast Technical University. Um, with mechanical engineering background. So I did HND. And then after the HND, I did my top part because uh, I was like, okay, let me do the top part because I want to go to the US and pursue higher education. Then that's why I did the top up. So I did HND and top up at Cape Coast Technical University. Okay, so thank you very much. What did you graduate with? So I graduated with first class uh, in mechanical engineering. A scholar. So you said you, you did that you did an H and D and you did a top up. How long was the H and D and how was the how long was the bachelor's? And when you said you had a first class, did you have a first class in both? Or when you combined both of them, maybe get like can you explain this to us into details? Okay, so the H and D was three years and the top up was two years. So I had first class in both the H and D and then the degree. So I completed the HND 2020. Okay. Then the top up was 2021 and 2022. So the, the degree was two years and then the HND was three years. So making five years in all with all first class. Yeah. Okay. So tell us, did you have to do WS evaluation? Or when you are done, tell us about your journey. How did you start? How did you find the schools? How was the process like for you? Okay, so um, before I answer that question, I want to say this. Uh, so it's all about determination. You get it. Um, that's why I like this player a lot. Um, Ronaldo, you see, he's very determined and always he wants to achieve more. So basically, I didn't write GES, sorry, West. I didn't do West evaluation. I didn't write ILEX, TOEFL, nothing. So um, I didn't write any of them. Okay. And so, so let me walk you through my application journey. Okay. So I started this application when I was in H and D level two hundred. Okay. Wow. Well, okay. I was going for yeah, conference like seminars, study abroad seminars because I was determined to one day come to the US and pursue higher education. So after the H and D, um, I realized, okay, why don't I start writing my document for? for this application, like, so that I can put in my application. So I started writing my SOP. But before then, I was already in research collaboration with some professors abroad. Um, we were trying to come out with a scientific paper. So basically, I, I was into research. So writing the SOP wasn't something difficult for me because I know the basics of writing an SOP. After writing the SOP, I sent it to these professors for review. Um, what I can say about SOP is that it's very important in this application, like scholarship studies. Um, it 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 allow you to express yourself, whatever in terms of what you can do, what you want to do with this degree, and why you are applying for this degree, and why you want to go to um, why you want why you are applying for this university. So it's very important. So I started writing all the, at first I didn't know it was, it's very important after sending it to these professors. After the uh, review and they were like, oh, you've done a great job, but guy, I think you need to include this part, your aim, and then include why you're applying and also identify some faculty members 
in the university where you think you have common research interest so that it can be easy for you. So after they did that, I did exactly what they asked me to do, send it back to them. Then later on, they polished it and everything was okay. So I also included my research experience. Basically, I was aiming to apply for a PhD and not master because I was having this research experience already. So I did that, I included all the necessary stars and um, I also added my CV to them. The CV was very solid. That's why I think it's because of the CV and then the SOP why most of the schools waived my application fee for me. So I didn't pay any application fee. So my first school that I submitted this document to was um, Northern Arizona State University and I was admitted with PhD with full funding. And I realized that the faculty members there, uh, my research interest is somehow different from this. So why don't I explore? So I started applying to many of the universities here in the US and by God's grace, I got admitted into many of them with full funding. Yeah. Thank you very much for the brief summary. I have a few questions. So one, you said you started doing it. So when you were in HND or second year, you were not applying to schools. You were just preparing your documents. Yeah, so it took me almost a year. I'm not saying it should take someone a year to, to start applying. No, you can apply as early as possible if you think your documents are solid. But the reason why it took me a year was that like I wanted to have more research experience so that it can um, make my application very solid and stand out there. That's why I decided to apply after my HND. Yeah. So I'm a bit confused. Did you apply after your HND or after your bachelor's? Okay, so I applied um, third year's first semester of my HND. Okay, and you got admission or? Yeah, so that was when I got admitted into um, Northern Arizona State University. Okay. But where I am currently, I applied after my H and uh, after my degree, which is the okay. Degree. Okay, so you started applying, but when you got admission to North Arizona, you didn't go. Yes, yeah, exactly. So with with North Arizona, you got admission with just your H and D. Excellent. Okay, okay, that's good. North Arizona State University. Yeah, that's right. okay. Oh, that's good. So, so the people with H and D, if you just want to, this is one university that you could look at. North Arizona State University, if you want to go to yeah grad school. So, um, you you went for a direct PhD with your bachelor's. No need for masters, right? Yeah, that's right. And you talked about the fact that you were in collaboration, research collaboration with some professors outside of Ghana. How did you find them, or how did you get to know? Them. Okay, so um, at first, not even at first, still I used to post on LinkedIn about my research progress. So I posted one of my research progress about computational fluid dynamics. And I was there and a professor from University of Birmingham, Dubai campus reached out to me that, oh, I like your work. I like what you are posting on LinkedIn. Can we collaborate to bring out a paper? And I was like, yeah. That's okay. I'm even looking for someone, a professor to collaborate with. So this is a big opportunity for me. So before then, I was already having, I was already having people on nuclear, nuclear energy simulations. So I told him that, okay, I have these people that um, I want to publish it. So um, if he can collaborate on these people so that we can publish it. And he was like, okay, I should send him the paper. I sent him the paper, we worked on the paper and at the end it got published. So basically, um, most of the professors that I collaborated, I got them from LinkedIn. And also I did a research and I find, if I find out that you have a research interest in CFD, I just reached out to you through email. Then we collaborate together, come out with a paper, then we publish it. And that's impressive. So how many papers did you have before you started your program? So um, I had, two papers and one book on Amazon. So the book was about um, turbines, nuclear turbines. Okay. And the book you wrote it your own or you collaborated with people? Uh, so I wrote it my own, but it was supervised by my um, doctor, Aquada. He was my VTEC or bachelor's supervisor. So he reviewed before um, 
publishing it on Amazon. Hey, pressure, pressure. Okay, okay. It's like now we are we are drifting off of the topic. <laughs> <laughs> now let's let's go. Um, were there some schools you applied to that you didn't get admissions to? So after your bachelor's, you decided to now start the journey serious seriously. How did you shortlist the universities? Which universities did you apply to? Which one did you get admission? Which one did you need to get admission to? And which one did you finally attend? Okay, that's a nice question. So uh, I was having this Excel book. It's like I created Excel for myself. And the reason why I created the Excel was to track the progress of my application. So basically I applied to, I think, eight universities. Okay. I applied to eight universities in the US. And I got accepted into seven universities That's with cool. my H and D, and then my degree. Mm -hmm. So I was rejected. I was rejected by uh, Rexena Polytechnic in the US. I mm -hmm. don't know if I'm clear with the name. Yeah. So I was rejected, and I felt very bad when I got rejected. But then I realized, okay, it's part of the game. So. Um, you got admission to seven. That one that you didn't get admission, that's the one you felt bad about. Yeah, I felt bad because I was like, so what went wrong? So I reached out to the admission committee and I asked why why did they reject me? And they were like, they don't have funding in their department and they don't have teaching assistantship funding in the department. So I have to reach out to a faculty member. Okay. And it's not because of my application, but then they don't have funding. Um, to fund my education. That's why they rejected me. And so you also didn't me, reach out when you were applying? No, no, I didn't reach out to any faculty member. So I saw on their website that they are, they have um, um teaching assistantship staffs there and I just applied. Okay. Yeah, I didn't reach out to any faculty member during my application. Okay. I just want to add up. So it's also very important, like even there are some schools that might not request it, but if you are actually applying for a research, okay, that reminds me there are two things I wanted to say. I'll say that one first before I for I for I forget. Um when you're applying, you talked about um like um uh, your SOP putting the name of potential supervisors and all those things. There, there, there are two programs that you could apply for. You could apply for a professional program and a research program. And most of the things we talk about, we talk about research-based program because you are going to perform research. But for people who are applying for coursework or professional programs, you really don't need to find a supervisor. And most of the time for these things, you have to pay out of your pocket if your focus is North America. But for the professional, like in places like in the UK and all those places, you might get funding for thought programs. In, in Canada, there are a few programs that you could have like funding for thought programs or coursework. So that's the difference. For people who are applying for coursework or professional programs, you would not need a supervisor. And back to what I was saying, like when you're also applying for a research-based program, it's always nice to reach out to potential supervisors or potential professors because you will be performing research and you need somebody to supervise you. So it's always nice to have like a first contact with somebody who might help you or who you might work with. So, so yeah, they, um, so now let's continue. So they said that, okay, because you didn't reach out, you didn't get admission to that. Yeah. And, okay. And those schools you applied to, could you have also applied directly with your HND or you needed to have a bachelor's equivalent? Um. So I think, some of the universities, from my experience, um, they required you to have a four-year bachelor's degree to be equivalent to the U.S. bachelor's degree. But if you do worse evaluation, sometimes it may be considered as a four-year bachelor's degree. Like your HND may be equivalent to um, U.S. Um, bachelor's degree. But um, for Northern Arizona State University, um, it was just a first shoot of my application okay so it wasn't like um i it wasn't like i wanted to complete the degree before applying so my my application my sop were all solid and i was like okay let me apply with my um hnd transcript and see if i'm going to make it and yeah i make it but the rest of the school i was already having this uh, the degree i was having the degree already so i was well 
let me apply with a degree plus the HND because uh, normally it's very stressful when you re when they realize your um, HND is not equivalent. But sometimes you can reach out to them and ask if I have a HND, I want to find out if it's equivalent to the bachelor's degree. If it is, they will tell you to put in your application. If not, they will ask you, some to, some to ask you to do waste evaluation and it will be equivalent to the um, US bachelor's degree. So, um, yeah. Okay, so just to, uh, like, the HND is not equivalent to a US bachelor's degree. Some because schools, the duration, some, no, So I want to, some schools, okay, some schools consider HND um, to be equivalent. To, because I know, I, know, I know so many people in the US here with HND doing PhD and master's. Okay. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily have to be equivalent to the four-year degree. Okay. It's they do accept HND as a minimum requirement. Yes. I don't know that's a difference. So the yes. HND is not equivalent, but some yes. schools do accept an HND. Excellent. That's yes. right. So that, that's what I'm saying. But an HND is not equivalent to yeah. the four-year the university. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So um, you, you mentioned that for all the schools that you applied to, you didn't have to pay an application fee. Nothing. Okay, so I for like, there are so many questions I want to ask. So before the application fee, I forgot, I just remembered one. How did you input your three years HND and your two years bachelor's in there? Which one did, did you have to choose one? How did you put in those details for your educational degree? So when you're applying for, uh... When, when when you when you want when you when you when you're applying for the uh the schools i think they have a portion where they ask you about your educational background so basically they ask for previous and then the current one okay so if you're having hnd or two certificates you just put in the first the the higher one and um the lower one okay so here my h and my degree was always first and then followed by the hnd so basically when you're applying, they will ask you about your education background. Uh, when you are putting the application or uploading the application, you have a chance to upload as many documents as you have. So basically, that wasn't an issue for me at all. Okay. Uh, just This is just a play on words on the words you use, because when you say the higher one and the lower one, <laughs> I don't agree with your, your choice of words. So <laughs> do you want to rephrase it or I oh, should rephrase yeah. it for you? <laughs> So what I'm trying to say is that we all know that um, degree is higher than HND, right? So in what because it depends on when you say it's higher. It it you get what I mean. It depends on. So but so, yeah. so it's not like I'm trying to look down upon HND. No, that that's not what I mean. Okay. But what I'm trying to say is that so the degree was was my current one, then the HND was previous one. Because I did the HND before the degree, so always I have to I put in the current one, which is the degree, followed by the previous one, which is the HND. Okay, so okay. yeah, I, I'm just going to rephrase it to make it, but um, for people to um understand. Really understand. Yeah, Gosh, yeah, try. I get what you are saying, but your choice of words is just a bit dicey, and other people might not understand. It. So what he's trying to say is that usually when you are putting in these details, just like he said, it's always the current one, like the last one you did and the other one. So they will ask you like your university degrees. He yeah. did his, his bachelor's. His bachelor's is the fresh, freshest degree he has. So it will come because you also have to put in the, the years. So yeah. maybe 2010 to this year, then he puts in his HND from this year to, to this year. That's what he means by, by the higher one and the, the lower one. So now, that, so for the degree, you just have to, so if, if you have three or four degrees, and usually when you are putting in these details, it's the degree is the your educational qualification after your senior high school. So if you've had like maybe three or four degrees, you could just put them in that order, the the latest one and the, the not latest one. So you said you got application fee waiver for all the schools you applied to. Can you tell us the schools and how you were able to get the application fee waiver? So I applied to Iowa State University. Okay. I applied to so Iowa State University, Northern Arizona State University, okay. um, the State University of New York, okay. uh, University of Birmingham, um, uh, University College of London. 
So okay. it's in the UK. I think it's one of the best universities. It's it's it has been listed number ten of the best universities in the world so far as, as at 2023. Yeah. So Northern Arizona State University. So these are some of the schools that I applied to, and my application fee was, was waived because one, I reached out to the coordinator, the admission coordinator, yeah. specifically the one in my department. So mechanical engineering graduate coordinator. I reached out to him or her. Then I explained to him that okay, I'm interested in your program, but here is because I don't have money to pay for the application fee. I was being specific because yes, I don't have that huge money to pay. Okay, like hundred dollars, seventy-five dollars, eighty-five dollars. It's very huge when you convert to Ghana cities. So I reached out to the coordinator with my document, which implies my CV and transcript. So basically, they will go through this CV, my, my CV and transcripts, and they, some of them realize, oh, you have a good transcript, you have a good CV, so here is application fee waiver for you. So these are some of the, the, the tips that I followed when I, whenever I wanted my application fee to be waived. So basically, I reached out to coordinator, then with my document, which is CV and transcript, then they waive it for me. But for Iowa, where I am now, Iowa State University of Science and Technology, I didn't reach out to the coordinator. So they have two phases of application. They have first phase and second phase. So for the first phase is where you only submit your um your your details, your personal details, your CV, your um, transcripts and any other document but you are not required to submit a so um recommendation the recommendation will come after the first phase so after submitting all these document i was there one day and then the graduate coordinator from the mechanical engineering department reached out to me and he was like i've been selected or shortlisted as one of their best applicants for the phd staff so um they are waiving my hundred dollars application fee waiver for me so this is how i got all my application fee waived so i want i'll encourage all of those who are trying to apply that they should reach out to the coordinator in their department and also the admission team as well the admission team is not having application fee waiver code they want you to reach out to your department maybe they may have and also if you reach out to a faculty member sometimes too they may pay your application fee waiver for you because you are coming to work with them. So this is the process and tips, tricks where I was able to get application fee waiver for all my application. I didn't pay anything. I didn't pay even 10 pesos for my application fee. Okay, this is good and thanks for thanks for telling us. And did you need to find a supervisor? Did you send emails to supervisors? Yeah. I sent email to supervisors, but some of them, <laughs> some of them never reached out to me. I don't know when they are going to reply to my email. I think it's normal in this process. It's normal. It's part of the game. <laughs> it's normal. You even <laughs> you even follow up plenty of times, but I thought they will not reach out to you. So. Yeah. Yeah, I sent out a cold email to many professors, and some of them were like, oh, I don't have funding in my lab, but then I can recommend you to other professors. Yeah. They did, and I reached out to those professors, that, and they also said the same thing. They don't have funding as at that moment. But after I got admitted into some of the universities, and many of the professors started reaching out to me that they want me to work or work as part of their research team members in their group or so you need their research lab yeah so i don't know why but um until so i have realized when i came to the us i've realized they are very busy very very super busy so that's why maybe some of them may not re, um, reply to your um, email but um, it shouldn't discourage you always keep on trying one day who knows and yes, will reply you with a positive um, news Exactly. And to just add up on like the coding Moses, as you said, people are busy, like you can't yeah, yeah, they are busy. Hold it. Because personally, as I'm doing this, I receive a lot of emotional mm -hmm. people 
and I can't respond to every email because I also have like other commitments. What some professors do is there's also a period of hiring. Yeah. If you're on social media, you realize that I'll get to a point during the year this professor is looking for students and all those things. So it's during this period that they are actively searching for students. So when you send a code email and it's not during that period or they are too busy, they collate everything into a folder in their email. When it's time that they are looking for students, then they will start reading and whoever they think is a good fit, they will respond to them. Sometimes that's what happens. So if you are not hearing from them, it's also probably the time or the period that you send those emails. If they're not looking for students, yeah. And even if they are looking and they read the email and they don't think it's a good fit, you can't respond. If you are receiving 100 emails, you can't respond to everybody. It's like, it, it takes a lot of time. So that's how the code email works. So if you don't hear from anybody, like there's really no hard feelings. You just move on to, to the next. So I, I also want to add something to this for you. You see, um, the subject of your code email should be very strong. Okay. Yeah. Um, remember, many, many plenty of students out there are applying. The Indians, the those from the Canada, everywhere they are applying, reaching out to one faculty member. So your 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 code email shouldn't be like shouldn't be straight, straight, straightforward thing. At least you should express your tell them what you can do and why they should hire you in your in their lab okay so you can describe you can talk about your research experience and why you think and what you can bring to the lab as well because they want experienced people with high um excellent research experience so if you're having a research experience and even if you are not having a research experience just tell them what you can bring on board than to go forward and say oh hi i want to be part of your research group they will never reply to you. So always your code image should be very, very strong and very interesting. And if you don't know how to write a code email on my channel, I've made a video on how to write a code email. So go check that video out. So um, I'm going to, we are going to summarize it. Like what are some of the challenges you face during the application process? And what advice would you give to the people who want to undertake this journey? So this application is very stressful. <laughs> It's extremely stressful. Even after you've submitted your application, uh, the waiting time is very stressful. So basically, what I can say is that never give up because if I've been able to make it doing two PhDs at the same time, my background from technical school, and even I forgot to say this, when I was applying to these universities, it was a break, like long vacations. So I went back to the village and there was no network in the village. Okay, so I have to position my phone. I was having two phones as at that time. I positioned one of my phone <laughs> in our area. So I have this cocoa tree there where I positioned the phone. Then I hotspot that phone to my laptop. Then I was applying. Even it was when it was raining, I made sure I've, I've covered the phone with rubbers and everything because I was determined to come to the U.S. and stay. Okay, so never give up that is the only thing i can say you should never give up and always try to apply more and make sure your documents are very strong if if the school requires you to do waste evaluation or advise you to do waste evaluation because you're going to vault it at the end of the day so give your sops your cvs to people to review for you because it's very important you may not know that maybe what you've written there is wrong but the third person or the second person will be able to identify that and correct you. So it's very important to always make sure you are sharing your document to other people for a review. And trust me, you can make it. Never give up until you see congratulations. I love that. Never give up until you see congratulations. That's like, I'm going to take that word. I'll be using it more <laughs> often and I'll cite you. But um, thank you very much for your feedback. But what are some of the challenges you personally face, apart from like the internet, like in the application process where there's some challenges, people complain a lot about recommendation letters, getting their transcripts and all those things. Did you face all these things? Um, for my recommendation stars, I didn't face any challenge because I was already having these professors there who are ever ready to write or put in my recommendation letters for me. Um, but but the challenges 
I, should I even classify this as a challenge? Um, it's when uh, it's, it's when it, it, it was a waiting time. <laughs> I don't know if I should classify yeah, it as a challenge. Yeah. It was very stressful because I have to reach out to many of the, the admission team and ask them when, is, when are they going to review my application. Okay, but doing my application by God's grace, I never faced any challenge. And even if you face a challenge during this process, still never give up. Okay, challenge are meant to happen. So if you face a challenge, you shouldn't you shouldn't give up. Just keep on trying, and trust me, everything is going to be fine. Okay, thanks. One last question. Then um, I would like what was, what was the question I wanted to ask? Yeah. On the issue of um, direct, because a lot of people are scared to go do a direct PhD with yeah. their bachelor's. And you are here, you said you are doing a double PhD. What yeah. does that mean? And would you advise people to consider their direct PhD with the BSc? So, personally, it depends on what you want to become in the future. For me, I want to become a professor in future, okay? So basically, the only thing that can grant me access to become a professor is a PhD, okay? And I don't need masters to become a professor. I only need a PhD to become a professor. So the reason why I went or I, I decided to go for direct PhD is that. And um, also, uh, my advice to those out there is that it depends on what you want to become in the future. So if you want to become in the future, and if you want to become a professor in the future and if you, you want to apply for direct PhD, I would advise you to go ahead. You see, PhD um, is, to me, based on the experience, I can say PhD is only 10% intelligence and, and the 90% is hard work. Okay. So, so basically, that is all what I can say, that if you want to apply for a direct PhD, yeah, you should go ahead and do that. It's, it's not anything, because many people have been able to do it. You are not the first person coming to do PhD with direct, um, with bachelor's degree. So so if you want to do a direct PhD with bachelor's degree, I would advise you to go. And also, I am doing PhD in neuroscience and mechanical engineering at Iowa State University. So basically the neuroscience is a co-major, um, but then I'm satisfying all the, the staffs in there. So I'm doing, taking courses, doing research with different labs, plus uh, my major, which is PhD in mechanical. So basically, if you want to apply for direct PhD, it's not a bad deal. I would just advise you to go on, but make sure you are applying for what you 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 have interest in if you don't have interest in what you are coming to do then please don't try because you will suffer in a way so make sure you have interest in whatever you are coming to do and trust me everything will be fine okay so um thank you i keep on saying last last question this one is my last uh, question uh, uh, <laughs> what was the founding what was the founding package you got from iowa state okay so my funding includes stipends, which is a nice stipend. Yeah. I'm being able to survive on it. It's okay for me, basically. And so it includes stipend, full tuition. Um, my health insurance is being covered. If I want to go for a conference, it is being covered there. And yeah, so these are the four things. My, so I'm not paying a tuition fee. I don't pay tuition fee. So I don't pay anything, basically. I don't pay anything if, if I'm right, but I, I don't pay anything. It's being covered by the university, but they are also expecting you to do more. You get it. So yeah, I get you. Uh, they're expecting you to do more research, especially your supervisor is expecting you to explore, do more research. And basically that's all. So so you don't you also have to satisfy some of the courses like your GPA should be strong to for you to be maintained your scholarship and your funding aspect. So these are the four things my um, scholarship is being covered. Okay, so um, just once again, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It was a great conversation. I learned uh, a lot. Give me your final words, then we'll end it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so as I said earlier on, 
never give up on until you see congratulations it's very important to me it has helped me a lot because i never give up my background everywhere i never give up and I, I i never see myself to be from technical university so i was like oh it's like people from those schools like tech legal and are applying so what am i going to do as a technical background never i never see myself to be one of like those people that they, they always want to say something to um discourage themselves but then i try to stand out there and trust me i was able to um, find my way out in the u.s so what i can say is that um always try to prove yourself that you can do okay try to prove yourself to people that you can do and also never give up whenever you need help reach out to people you think they can help you see this application this scholarship journey is very tough so um, if you think you need help, just reach out to the right person. Never give up. Always try as many as possible that you can. Okay. If you want to apply to many universities, try to apply. Reach out to your recommenders. So, Prof, I want to apply to this university. Can you please submit um, a recommendation letter for me? If he can, yes. And always be a good person so that your professors your your doctors your teachers your lecturers will be able to write a good recommendation for you because me i think my recommendation was number one or if i should show you one of my recommendation letters you love it so always make sure you are being a good person it's very very important be a good person to your professor your lecturer whoever the person is don't try to underestimate a person but rather make sure you are being a good person to whoever you will see out there and it's going to help you a lot okay thank you so if you have any questions leave it in the comment section we'll try as much as possible to help you and if you want to get into contact with joseph his name is joseph amponsa you will yeah. find him on linkedin linkedin is the best place for people to find you right yeah yeah linkedin is the best place okay yeah so just uh, just reach I'm, out I'm, yeah i'm not on facebook i'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Instagram, I'm on LinkedIn and all. Okay, so if you want to reach out to him, reach out. So thank you very much. And to hear from me again.